Okay. Good evening. Thank you all for turning out in this uh, dark and miserable winter's evening. My name is Dr. Sam Cooper from the Dyson School of Design Engineering, a new department at Imperial College. Uh, and it's my total delight this evening to introduce my colleague uh, and friend, uh, Marcus Ulmfors, who actually studied in this lecture hall with me for, should have been four years, was only three years, um, he'll explain why, uh, for 1,000 hours or so, learning all about mechanical engineering at Imperial College, before he set off on an eclectic journey through the real jobs world. And I myself, of course, never joined him on this journey, having stayed in academia ever since. Uh, and Marcus, this evening, is going to relate to you all the most exciting things that are going on in the manufacturing and analysis of batteries. Uh, and I can see many familiar faces this evening, as Imperial is, of course, one of the UK centers for battery science. Uh, so without any further ado, Marcus, I'd like to invite you to the stage. Let's welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for everyone for taking the time this evening to, uh, to join us, um, listen to uh, Battery Talk and what is going on in manufacturing in Europe. Um, thank you, Sam, for inviting for Energy Futures Lab to, to host here at Imperial College London. It's, uh, it's a special day in many respects. For me personally, it's great to be back in London. It's great to be back at Imperial College and in this very lecture theater where I spent, uh, as Sam mentioned, uh, probably thousands of hours learning about engineering and, um, and laying that foundation. Um, so for me, I graduated from here, mechanical engineering in 2012. And since then, I've been working with different kinds of energy systems, solar, wind, the batteries, um, but also in software engineering and app development, and machine learning and data science, uh, which is now what I combine at Norfolk, where I do data science, specifically analysis of lithium-ion cells, and, uh, and PACS for that matter. But it's not only a special day for me, it's a special day for lithium-ion technology and science in, uh, in a broader spectrum, because uh, today is the 10th of December, and the 10th of December every year is a noble day, which means that we, we recognize science uh, and, and the contribution to humankind, and this year, in particular, the prize in chemistry went to three academics that you may very well know. <coughs> John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham, and Akira Yoshino. So I want to start this, this talk with just uh, acknowledge their contribution to, um, to science and to the lithium-ion battery world. And obviously, our, our company at Norfolk would it's heavily building on their work, and so are many other uh, companies, and we couldn't see the electrification that we are going through today without their work. Uh, and I actually managed to get a screenshot from um, just uh, two hours ago. This is the city hall in Stockholm, only one <coughs> kilometer from our head office, as they are just 30 seconds before receiving the, the award from the King of Sweden. It's a very, very special evening uh, tonight. I um, had in mind the following outline. Talk about Norfolk a bit in, in general. Uh, I'm actually really curious, being in the UK and being at, uh, at Imperial College, who has heard of Norfolk before seeing the advert for this talk? Maybe half, roughly, maybe a little bit more. Uh, that's very, very good. And then I want to just introduce what we're doing. Moving on, why we obviously, obviously think that it's a good idea to establish manufacturing capability in Europe. Uh, so I want to go through the, the reasons and the approach why we think that is true. Also, how we think this should be done. Uh, and a little bit of a snapshot, how we're doing things, what, have we, what we have been doing so far, and what happens next. All right, so, so what is Northvolt? Uh, for those of you who, who are new to Northvolt, we are a very young battery company. We are aiming to build the world's greenest battery. Uh, that's our mission, doing with uh, renewable energy in Europe uh, at a competitive, uh, uh, in a competitive way. 
we, um, we are also striving to take control of a big part of the value chain, which means that we want to know what happens from raw materials to end of life and recycling to get uh, the deepest knowledge, develop the best models and create the smartest battery. The history so far for Norfolk starts with Peter Carlson and Paolo Ceruti. They were both previously at, responsible for uh, supply chain at Tesla. At, um, and a few years ago, they decided to, to move home to Europe and uh, start the, uh, this battery venture. This started as a, a project, a feasibility study to see, is this really possible? Is it a good idea to, to manufacture in Europe? Is it even possible? As you very well know, there is a clear dominance in Asia for, for this kind of expertise. Can we make that happen also in Europe? Um, so this project was, was set out to, to answer that question. They obviously proceeded. And uh, one year later, in about two years, two years ago, it was announced that we would establish the first gigafactory in the north of Sweden, in, uh, outside of Skellefteå. This uh, factory is called Ett, which is the Swedish word for one. And it has a design capacity of uh, an initial 32 gigawatt hours per year. So a rough translation, that would be half a million, maybe 600,000 cars, fully electric. It's also roughly, for, for those here keeping count, it's roughly the design capacity of uh, Tesla's first gigafactory in Nevada. A few months ago, we also announced that we'll build a second gigafactory at an initial design capacity of uh, 16 gigawatt hours per year in Germany, uh, together with Volkswagen, uh, with the Volkswagen Group. And we do that because they, uh, they will need a lot of batteries uh, for their aggressive plans into electrification. And again, in um, October 2019, just two months ago, we were finished with the, all the plans, including environmental permitting, all the ground preparation in the north of Sweden, in Skellefteå, at the site for Northvolt Ett so we could start building the construction. This means the concrete raising the steel structure, and this is now ongoing. And in order to answer the question of why is lithium ion batteries a good idea? Do we need them? How much do we need? When do we need it? I want to paint the, just the general global picture. Where, where are we in the energy space globally? and what is happening in the next few years? What are the big trends? And the two major things that are happening are renewable energy coming online on the grid and a massive move for uh, electrification in the transport sector. That is really what is driving the big volumes. So let's start with the global energy outlook uh, and look at what is happening at renewable energy space. Over the last 20 years, we're seeing a, a pretty clear picture, picture. These are cumulative numbers. So what has been installed so far? We see strong increases in both solar and wind. These numbers go up to 2016, but 2017, 2018 have been roughly the same. The same, uh, same gradient, the same in installation pace. And what I personally think it is quite interesting is, uh, especially for, for people who are not following, but there's a lot of development in offshore wind, going from, from onshore parks to offshore parks to floating offshore, which means that we will untap new uh, locations, and the more we install, the better we get at the engineering and construction, the cheaper it gets, the more we can install at more sites. So this is very promising. But with more integration of renewable sources, we get more intermittency in the grid. We need to make sure that we can design around this. With only half a percent of renewable energy, half a percent of intermittent uh, production, that's very easy. Once you get to 5, 10, 20%, it gets a bit more challenging. 
And, and some countries go way beyond that as well. So we need batteries for that. But also, as we transition to electrified transport, we need to make sure that those batteries that we need in the vehicles are also produced with renewable energy. So these really go hand in hand. Now, next, we'll look at the sales of electric vehicles. And in contrast to the previous slide, this is yearly sales figures. This is not cumulative. What we see are sales figures that increase by 40-50% yearly. Even from, you see, 2011, very low numbers, less than 100,000 cars a year. But with 40-50% yearly increase, these exponentials get large very, very quickly. And of course, we need batteries not only for automotive and for transport. There are lots of grid applications and uh, other interesting areas and applications. But it's, it's clear that the transport sector is going to be the main driver. Uh, many estimates would, uh, would land us in figures around 8 to 5, maybe even 90 percent of, um, of lithium-ion demand will go into cars, buses, and trucks. So that's why this is important. And the reason this is important is because of the cost driver. When you make a mobile phone, that battery is in the order of 10 watt hours. Now, if you can make a cell at $1,000 per watt hour or kilowatt hour, which was true um, not so long ago, probably around here, 2011 or so, not long ago, then your phone battery would cost $10. So if you sell a $1,000 phone with a $10 battery, not a problem. If you can reduce that to $2 for a $1,000 phone, great, but it doesn't matter. Now scale that to a car with 100 kilowatt hours, which is true for the largest batteries today. Now we're talking about the difference between a $100,000 battery and a $10,000 battery. If you can get this cost down to $100 per kilowatt hour, for example. And this is the difference between a niche very expensive product, and something that's affordable to, to the masses. So we go from a, a supply chain that is optimized for something with small cells, something quite small, to something that needs to be cheap at scale. Where we, and also, a phone battery that dies after two years, it's okay. If it lasts three years, great. A car battery that lasts two, three years, useless. So not only do we need to keep costs down, but we also need to increase the longevity in a predictable way. So that's why this is really in the center of everything that we uh, look at. Interesting for the people who keep track of history of large lithium-ion factories is going back to 2014, maybe. Somewhere around there, Tesla announced their first gigafactory in Nevada with a design capacity of 35 gigawatt hours per year. Now that translates to, in their case, about 500,000 cars a year, um, which is a lot. But last quarter, they delivered 97,000, meaning roughly 400,000 cars a year. So they've hit that almost today. At that time, the global output for lithium-ion batteries was 35. And they plan to add another 35. And that 35 was for everything. That was cars, phones, laptops, everything with lithium-ion batteries. The idea at that time was seen as really quite crazy, quite out there. But as we see now, we have reached those numbers and beyond and multiples of it. It's now really clear that not only was that the right thing to do, but it really looks obvious in hindsight. In fact, going forward and stretching out this prediction to see where will we be in a few years' time in terms of demand for lithium-ion batteries, th these are the estimates that we uh, can use. 2016, around 70 gigawatt hours per year. 2018, uh, roughly 100, then go up to 200 next year. And in 2025, 1,000 gigawatt hours per year. 
at, and this is globally. So that means 30 of the, of the size of the gigafactories that we have been talking about so far. If you look at Northvolt's plan, we are just building our first factories now and should be at roughly 48 gigawatt, gigawatt hours at, uh, by 2024. It's a really aggressive timeline and very, very ambitious project. But it's still quite a small share of where we need to be globally. We also estimate that uh, in the space of Europe, we will need roughly 20% of the global market. The reason being 20% of the cars in the world are manufactured in Europe. 20 million out of a 100 million global market. And that is what's driving these numbers. All right, so now it's, it's really quite obvious that we need these factories, we need lots of them, we need them very soon. And actually, if you stretch out this a few years into the future, we go to 2030. The estimate is way above 1,000. We're looking at 2,700 off the charts in this case. We, uh, it's kind of weird when you have to think about doing industry projections and have to consider log charts, but that's really the space we have here. And this is not easy to scale. From the time you decide to build a factory, you do the planning, environmental permits, the site clearing, making the ground preparations, start making the construction. It's roughly a five-year project. So if you decide you want to hit that 2025 timeline, you need to get busy now. We have realized this, and we're not alone. Tesla used to be the only one in this space, and now there are many dozens of uh, factories, maybe even actually closer to 100 uh, being prepared. This is the global space today, roughly, the data from uh, Benchmark Mineral Intelligence. What I want to highlight here is you have Tesla as uh, the clear, one of the, the well-known brands, obviously from uh, California, uh, America. And then you have also some famous brands if you're in the battery space with LG and Samsung, BYD, Panasonic, CATL, SK Innovation, and so on. All Asia. So it's China, South Korea, Japan. And then there's Northvolt, the only really homegrown lithium ion producer in, um, in Europe. Okay, so I hope that we, we agree that we, we need these factories, we need them very soon, even with the most aggressive timelines and the most ambitious projects. It's going to be tough to, to scale with quality and to meet the demand. And when you get to design from scratch and you say we have a new project, we have a, uh, an, an opportunity to do things the way we want to design them without taking into account legacy systems or traditions and we can create a new team. Uh, what do we then do and how do we design our standards? <coughs> so first of all, we have a very strong commitment to renewable energy. Uh, we, will, we have chosen the site in the north because we have access to 100% renewable energy the majority being hydropowered, but there's also a, a component of wind. We also want to use renewable materials. So from day one, recycling has been part of the, of the process and part of the concept. This is an enabled with vertical integration where we go take the, uh, a big chunk of the value chain. We want to do many of the processes. Uh, and more that is conventionally done so that we can design recycling processes and we can design material uh, production and active material processing. We believe that being a homegrown European actor, we can know our customers. We have logistics within Europe. 
Often supply chains can span across the world, across continents, and we want to bring that closer. We uh, have a very ambitious plan for data collection, modeling, traceability, connect everything in the factory, connect everything in the batteries. And what we want to do is go all the way from the raw materials to packs, build cells, build packs, do recycling, collect data from each step so that we can create the best models available. We can also, when designing new factories, choose a very high rate of automation, which, which makes it uh, even more suitable for data collection. Geographically, we're based from the start in Stockholm, where, as I mentioned, uh, the Nobel Prize for lithium-ion technology was just awarded two hours ago. In the north, we have the planned North Voltet, the first gigafactory. That's 800 kilometers north of Stockholm. And the site is chosen for, uh, for many different reasons, but one of the drivers is access to a lot of renewable energy uh, at affordable rates. This region has uh, an excess of energy that it exports, and it, it's a good place to, to build a factory. An hour west of Stockholm, we have uh, Norfolk Labs, which is our uh, mini factory. It's, uh, it's going to be, for a while, our main factory until we finish the gigafactory. Um, and then it's going to transform into an education center, training grounds, and a place where we can do product development without interrupting the mass manufacture. In Poland, we have an assembly plant where we take cells, make modules and packs that we can then deliver to partners and customers. So not only do we want to make the cell, but we also want to make the packs that are ready products, ready to use. And then the plan in Germany to, um, to build the first customer-dedicated gigafactory. That will be an exercise really in what we're trying to achieve is not only a process for building loads and loads of, of high-quality cells, but also building several um, high-quality factories. So this is an exercise in creating a, a digital blueprint and repeatedly uh, build factories at high pace and high quality. We, as I mentioned, will focus quite a lot on automotive sector because that's where the highest volumes are. And you could build a very, very healthy business and be very busy by just delivering sales to automotive OEMs. And that includes then cars, buses, trucks, and so on. But what we want to do is, is go beyond that. We see that in, in many applications, there is a need for electrification, but these customers or the, the manufacturers of, of those um, products might not have the resources to come battery experts. If we send them cells, they will not be able to to write the BMS or to build a cooling system or to, to uh, create an entire pack. It might not be in, in their interest. But these sectors still need to be electrified. And that's where we want to help. And this is what we call enabling the future of energy, where we will build the packs, write the BMS, build the cooling system, design the, the mechanical manifold, and make sure that these sectors can also be electrified. We have um, partners and investors in the automotive space, um, Volkswagen, being, Volkswagen Group being a very, a very notable example. In the grid space, we might have domestic battery backups, uh, or you imagine a manufacture site where you need to do peak shaving, or maybe with renewable energy production, for example, Vestas being uh, one partner, can we be smart in when we produce, when we consume, 
Uh, can we be smart in how we regulate frequency? There's a lot to do here as well. For industrial, this would be construction equipment, mining equipment, it could be ferries, uh, and so on. We have a, a good partnership here also with a company called Epiroc, and they provide mining equipment for underground mines. It might not be obvious for why we should electrify this sector, but actually, not only is the right thing to do for consuming less diesel and making the sector cleaner, but there are very interesting business cases that are not immediately obvious. For example, when you're underground, hundreds of meters, and you're driving a 40-ton loader, typically that loader is powered by a diesel engine, a very big one. And one of the single biggest energy costs is ventilation. Because that diesel engine creates a lot of exhaust and it needs a lot of oxygen. If you remove the engine and electrify it, uh, you, you get rid of that cost. And the operators are now in, a, in an operating environment where it's uh, much less noisy, which means it's actually also safer uh, and, and, and better to go through. Portable, basically, uh, it can be anything normally what we say smaller than a car. S sometimes this is already electrified and there's a good progress. Sometimes we replace a two-stroke internal combustion engine. Also an interesting space to, to work in. A key part of our strategy is the vertical integration, and that means that we will buy materials from mines and make our own active material. That is the, the in our case, we will focus on the, uh, on the cathode. Then this goes to a process of, uh, of electrode manufacture. So we'll make a slurry mix, we coat a metal foil that becomes an electrode. You put the electrode in a can for cell assembly. Then you take that, uh, that cell and make a pack. And at the end of life, that pack goes into recycling. We will need help with the mining, but we will be involved in the rest. And this is really a crucial part of what we uh, believe will make us strong, because we can also then collect data from uh, each one of these steps. And this is good for, for many reasons. There are obviously commercial reasons. The more control you have, you, you, there's obviously a, uh, an aim to make each step here profitable for each company that is involved in a normal supply chain. So that's good. But it's also good for logistics. Very often you can have mining in the southern hemisphere somewhere. Then that material is shipped to Europe, maybe, or somewhere else. It's refined and sent maybe across to Asia, where you make the active material powder. That powder goes to yet another company that makes the electrode, and maybe also the cell in the same, in the same company. Then typically that cell goes to yet another product company that make it a product that goes to a consumer somewhere. Then at the end of life, hopefully, that battery is recycled at yet a different company. And uh, this is what we want to, to bring in-house under one roof. It's also great from a data perspective. If we can collect data from end of life and have data for the same cell during the material production or the electrode coating, we will know more about what really matters for the life of a cell and the performance during the entire lifetime. And of course, also for um, for sustainability. The, if we have this entire process, we can optimize the recycling step to match our first input process, which means that we can be, uh, be faster in recycling and improve that process at a pace that, that is greater. This is uh, somewhat of a busy slide. I don't generally like to put loads of little things in a single slide, but um, it's just to, to reiterate, you see, First of all, mining and refining, 
we put it next there. We're not, we're not going in, down to the mines. We, we appreciate having partners there that, uh, that are doing a good job and that we want to, to have a close dialogue with. But then we make our own cathode. We will buy the anode, um, not as a, well, we will buy graphite and then make our own cathode. But then we will make the electrodes. We will make, do the cell assembly, create the packs, and take care of the recycling. Okay. So this being a research and academic institution, let's, let's go a little bit deeper into the technology and talk about, uh, talk about chemistry and, and the lithium-ion uh, inodes, as it were. One of the questions I get when talking about Norfolk is, what is the secret sauce? What have you invented? What's exciting? Is there, uh, have you put sulfur in there? Is it lithium air? Uh, what's going on? What is so special? And in reality, if, if you were to take the cell, open up, or analyze it, or go through the design documents, you're not going to find anything that would get us the Nobel Prize. Uh, it's, we're designing a, uh, a modern cell where the NMC cathode, uh, graphite anode. And um, the reason for that is really that it is a proven technology and we see that it has a very good roadmap until at least 2030. Today what we see is that the biggest challenge is how can we scale by many multiples, many thousands of percent, the best technology that we have today, make it better of course, so we have our, our own design team that designs the chemistry that we, uh, that we then manufacture. So we have the capability of iterating on this design and make it better but you don't really need a 20% or 40% increase in energy density for this to be viable. We just need efficient um, manufacturer at scale at the highest quality that is available today with, uh, with the early improvements. Then of course, as we see more research going online and new discoveries and work on already lab scale technology that goes into pre-industrial phase. We will keep a very close eye on this and uh, we will respond to those new technologies and incorporate uh, and reevaluate as we go forward. Uh, I will leave my email address here when, before I leave. If you come up with something, uh, you know, send me a note. Um, then secondly, another important question that I get a lot is, what about raw materials? Will there be enough raw materials? What do you do with, um, with the tricky raw materials, for example, uh, cobalt from the DRC? What are we going to use that? What are we going to do? How can you possibly claim to be sustainable if that is the uh, uh, inevitable goal or inevitable way of producing batteries? And for us, we have a commitment to do and to produce in a sustainable way. And that doesn't stop at CO2. That also includes people, which means um, that we need to be uh, confident and comfortable about how things are sourced and how they're produced and what goes into our batteries. And uh, when we're now at small scale early on in the manufacture, what, uh, what we will do then is to start in, in different parts of the world, uh, other than the RC, uh, before we, we get to scale. Uh, so we postpone that a little bit. As we scale, we, we will consider all parts of the world, uh, including the DRC. Uh, what we believe is, we know that there are problems in, in, in some areas. We know that there are problems at some locations. But it, the wrong thing to do would be to blacklist an entire country because we also know that there are actors, there are companies and, and uh, co-ops that are doing a very good job. And we want to be there to support them. We want to be there also to set the highest quality standards and help them reach, it, reach them. And that's, that's how you build a, a sustainable supply chain. 
And this ties into how we structure our company and how we set out our strategy. This very much rhymes with having a deep vertical integration because we are buying from the mine. If we had three companies between ourselves and the mine with maybe two different refineries and then a uh, active material producer, auditability and due diligence is a much harder game. And now when we decide to buy straight from the mines, we can go and visit, we can have a, a customer relationship, and we can help, um, help where help is needed. Furthermore, we also see um, general trends in, uh, in design, uh, we, uh, where specifically cobalt is probably going to decrease per cell. We see that both in NMC and NCA. But obviously, the number of cells is going up in this, at the same time. So likely, cobalt uh, demand will, will increase over the years. We also see now quite a lot of activity in the European <coughs> Union with mines or, or found material that hasn't been economically viable now starts to become interesting as we see a more robust and more predictable increase in demand for all kinds of materials, including nickel and, and uh, other metals. This also ties into, um, ties into the recycling. So as, as shifts come with increasing demand, uh, uh, that also means that recycling becomes more and more interesting. So that, that's another response to, to deal with how uh, the ebbs and flows of raw materials. On that point, uh, recycling is really part of the strategy from, from day one, where we will receive packs in our facility uh, that is of, of our chemistry or similar. Then those packs need to be discharged, dismantled. This is, the dismantling is actually a, a very difficult step because a battery pack contains cells, but also lots of other stuff, adhesives and other wiring and electronics, and so on. Then you actually go through a crushing stage. It's not very elegant, but it's, it's effective. And then through the last hydromet stage where there are a few options for the last step. Uh, one is hydromet, where you can then start to separate the metals. It goes into one stream or another. And again, here the strength is that whatever comes out of this process is our input in the manufacture. So, so we can co-design these processes. And we believe recycling is, is not only the right thing to do from a sustainability perspective, uh, it's also good from a commercial perspective for, for the sake of reducing risk. If, if a price of some raw material goes up by a lot, then similarly our recycling process will be more valuable. So it's a way to to deal with this. It also means that we can improve designs in both ends and optimize for the entire chain instead of just one process, which would be the case if you isolated the process into one single company. And also, of course, each point here is a data collection opportunity. I've taken from uh, online sources here, um, Circular Energy Storage, Swedish Energy Agency, the contents of a, a typical modern NMC cell, cylindrical 18650, that's the form factor that Tesla used to use. It's quite common, you'll find it around uh, on the markets. What I think is interesting here is that you see the lithium content, less than 2%. Also, you, those of you who are have sharp eyes, you will see that these numbers do not add up to 100%. It's because we're leaving out the electrolyte and, um, and the separator, which we're not probably going to recycle. Um, otherwise, already quite little cobalt and manganese. Aluminium steel, you will actually get. You will get aluminium from one of the electrodes from the cathode, but you also get from the can uh, from a cylindrical cell.
So importantly for us, and again, key to why we do this entire vertical chain of uh, processes and activities is data and data modeling. So we start in the factory and each process from material, big batch processes where we make active material and also all the way through electrode preparation, manufacture, cell assembly and so on to building the packs. Uh, all these steps will produce data. Uh, we, we connect, the, the factories will be fully connected. Then we will send packs to customers. They will report telemetry data that we can track, we can see what the, uh, what the life is like, what the performance is like, and what the conditions are like. Do they correspond to our engineering assumptions when we design the pack? Or should we reconsider something? Do some packs have some characteristics or undergoing something that we didn't expect? Can we even maybe update the software on that particular pack to, to optimize how it's being used? We can also learn more about the cells uh, further on and maybe uh, as is already being done, tweak charging or discharging algorithms, set new power limits. And th this is enabled by the data collection and the fact that we have control of the product, not only the cell but also the pack. And then again, end of life and recycling. It's really cool idea to think that we have a pack out there where we have full control of the cells, we know how they were produced, we know what the pack went through, and then it comes back for recycling, and we can have a look at it, end of life. This lets us make new digital services and digital tools, monitoring, um, maintenance prediction, uh, obviously just improvements. If we know how packs are behaving, then we can improve the cells to respond to that. All right, so now I want to show you some of the work we're doing in the software team where I, where I belong. Uh, this is a machine learning application where we are going to secure quality. What you see at the bottom half is a visual inspection system, a camera that is capturing a live feed of an uh, electrode passing through. This electrode moves at the speed of roughly one meter per second. It's quite fast and we're detecting anomalies of less than one millimeter uh, in size, which calls for very high resolution. You're combining a very high resolution, very high speed, it's a lot of data. This goes through a vision inspection or a machine learning algorithm to detect the objects that are anomalies. But not only that, also the location of the electrode, because we want to know the exactly where the anomaly was in this two-dimensional space, along the electrode and across. I will play for you a few seconds of this clip and you will see identifiers, some markers on the left, which indicate where we are on the foil, uh, which means we know which electrode this will become later on, uh, and also bounding boxes identifying the anomalies. Taking this example, you can see that we have position number four contains uh, two anomalies and the, the prediction percentage. So we can see that as we cut these, this will later become many electrodes as we cut them longitudinally and across the latitude, and we can throw away what we don't need and what we don't want to send to customers. So now let's talk about factories. This is a render of the Norfolk Et Gigafactory. It is a pretty large site, so 500,000 square meters. So imagine about 500 meters times 1,000 meters. It takes a while to walk across. You see uh, two what we call uh, upstream buildings. That's where we make the active material. And then four lines of downstream buildings where we take from a slurry mix and coat electrodes and then all the way down to a finished cell, which is then going through formation and aging. We have started the construction of this factory. 
and uh, the first cell will be, be made here in roughly two years. Initial design capacity is 32 gigawatt hours, uh, which will, might, might increase to uh, 40. And um, we are now starting the construction of the first 16. So it's one upstream building and uh, two downstream rows. And to put that in perspective, we need a lot of energy for this. That's why it's important that we are in a renewable energy space for this location. That first half, the first 16 gigawatt hours out of 32, will require yearly around, probably actually a bit more than one terawatt hour. One terawatt hour is a third of a percent of the UK uh, electricity use. UK is roughly at 300 terawatt hours per year, and half this factory is around one. Which means access to renewable energy is really, really important. <coughs> and also strong grid. This is hundreds of megawatt, uh, megawatts of continuous power. And having the overview from uh, not too long ago, it looked like this. Still a bit of work to be done. Uh, and last Friday, we saw this. The steel structure coming up, these are about 30 meters high. And uh, it's really great for the team to see this coming along. Closer to Stockholm, we have uh, Norfolk Labs. This is much, much closer to be done. We, uh, the capacity of this site is 350 megawatt hours per year. Uh, when up and running at full pace. So that means it's still a mass manufacture site. We use basically identical processes and machinery. So if we can make stuff here, we can make it also in the Gigafactory. And we are planning to make our first cells here this month. So it's a really exciting time for the team. We're waiting for, for the first cells to come out. And uh, for the next two years, really, this will be the site that produces everything that we, we make in terms of cells. Um, and after th those two years have gone and we start producing at the Gigafactory, this will be an excellent site for training. We can have process engineers, technicians, and operators who can train on this equipment without, uh, without being in the, in the large factory. We can also prototype new products, or we can do tweaks in the manufacturing process and see how that works on real equipment without interfering with the mass production. Not far away from there, we, uh, we also have an R&D facility with a dry room. We can uh, make our own materials. We can make electrodes, cell assembly, and um, formation and aging. This is a lab scale uh, facility, uh, but very good for doing prototyping cells, pouch cells, or prismatic cells. And we have made cells here since March this year. Basically, our, our first designs of um, our materials and cell design goes into this facility. We make the cell and we test it. In uh, in Poland, we have this battery assembly line uh, on, on the pack level. So we, we take in cells. As you have noticed, we haven't actually started large-scale manufacture yet for our cells. So today we buy cells and we make packs from those. This gives us several year advantage. We can start making packs already today instead of waiting for our own cells. This is mainly assembly, not very energy intense. You'll see that uh, it's mostly manual putting, uh, uh, putting cells in, into modules, doing the wiring, making sure that it becomes a real battery pack that is ready for use. And one of the outputs is uh, these Epiroc deliveries. We have uh, packs in operation in mines 
uh, today. We also recently announced a joint venture with Volkswagen Group. We'll build a factory uh, for them and with them in Salzgitter in Germany. This is Northvolt 2, number two in German. And we'll start this construction in 2021. So it's already uh, well underway in terms of planning. Initial design capacity here will be 16 gigawatt hours. Um, and we'll start in roughly uh, 2023, 2024. Now, crucially, this is in Germany. It has a different energy mix than Sweden. And this is uh, something to crack for us. How can we make sure that we stay with our commitment to renewable energy? And the first step of that is actually to not do the entire process in Germany. The, uh, the upstream part, which is where we prepare the material, is it's the part of the manufacturer that's really energy intense. So we keep doing that in uh, Skellefteå in Sweden. We expand that uh, capacity and make the active material also for the German site. For the next part, that also requires electricity, of course, albeit a bit, a bit less. Uh, so that's something that we will have to announce further on before the start of production uh, in four years. But there are plenty of options for us to, to make sure that we uh, do not have to, to compromise on that commitment. Um, but stay tuned for, for that, those uh, pieces of news. OK. So now I want to go through a bit what has happened, uh, what goes on later on. I'm uh, joined today by uh, Joran and Emily uh, from the recruitment team and talent. Uh, because when you're building a venture like this, and when you're trying to make something new at a very rapid pace, and you're going into space where there are established players with decades of experience, uh, you need a good team with loads of passion and optimism. <laughs> and uh, we need good, good people to, to bring in and expand the team. Uh, and talking about the team, this is what we've done on team growth since the start of the company. Three years ago, we were five people. Uh, now we just crossed 500. And you'll see that half of that was hired in uh, the last six months. Which means that if you have been at Norfolk for about five, six months, you're now part of the old crew, as it were. <clears throat> so this, is, this is us, we had a little kickoff in, uh, in September this year to, to get to see the site. And we uh, cycled as a team of 260 people uh, on electric bikes uh, to, uh, to see what the site is like. A bit on the, on the company. Uh, if you hire 500 people, you can't do that for free. It costs a bit of money. Um, and this is how we sold that so far. The first round of investment came, um, or, or funding, uh, came in the beginning of uh, 2017, so roughly three years ago. And that made it possible to go from a first feasibility study to really kick, the, kick off the project. And then uh, what has been publicly announced, the really big milestone was this summer when, uh, when, the, when the equity fundraising was secured of uh, 900 million euros um, from a couple of uh, large investors, both financial and industrial. Then there's also some further debt financing and, uh, and some agreements with, with the customers that are interested in uh, battery cell deliveries, which means that um, we, we feel that we have a strong support from uh, from investors, from customers, uh, also from the political space. We, we, we feel that uh, we have uh, people on our side that want this to happen for, uh, for us to succeed, for Europe to succeed in building up this, uh, this space. If we produce 20 million cars a year, for example, in Europe, we will rely heavily on, on, uh, on lithium-ion batteries. 
And um, doing this kind of um, project requires a, a dedicated team, which, which is uh, nice to be able to say that we have. And uh, uh, we, uh, we're looking forward to growing that as well. We have plans for the next few years to hire thousands of more people, both in, in manufacture and construction and um, other roles, which is going to be incredibly exciting uh, thing to witness. So with that, uh, I'd like to open up for some questions and just thank you for your patience and, uh, and attention. Thank you.